Welcome everyone. Um, a bit of context, AI is one of the most significant technological advancements in recent years. Um, it's a movement that's all about augmenting our human potential. Currently, large language models are increasingly um, increasing exponentially in their power of an order of magnitude that we cannot kind of get our heads around. One of the stats I read is that AI is due to be a $1.4 trillion industry by 2029, impacting every sector. However, it has been constrained by limitations in computing power, which is where Cerebrus comes in. Cerebrus is revolutionizing the frameworks for AI. They build supercomputers that give AI practitioners the computational muscle to do their job faster and at scale. So we're incredibly privileged to be hosting Andrew Feldman, um, Cerebrus's co-founder and CEO. Andrew is an entrepreneur dedicated to pushing boundaries in the compute space. Um, Andrew, I believe this is your fifth company. Um, a few examples of his prior experience prior to Cerebrus, he co-founded and was the CEO of C-Micro, a pioneer of energy efficient, high bandwidth microservers, which was acquired by AMD um, for about 357 million. Before that, he was with Force 10 Networks, which sold to Dell. And then prior to Force 10, he was with Riverstone Networks from the company's inception all the way to IPO. This is a man who is pioneering fearless engineering, and we're really honored to be hosting you, Andrew. Joe, I will hand the reins over to you to kick this whole thing off. Irene, I want you to do introductions at Thanksgiving with my parents. I think that was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> we'll we'll rent her out to you uh, in exchange for one of your uh, clusters that we can experiment <laughs> with, really too, Andrew. <laughs> Um, so to the audience, uh, you know, you've you've heard me say in the recent months, right, that in my view, the investment in Cerebrus is uh, probably one of the most important and timely investments we've ever made on the Link2 platform since we launched. And I, I don't um, use those words lightly because... Um, as Irene said, uh, generative AI is going to be a foundational technology that will impact all sectors of commerce and interaction in the coming decades. But like all prior important foundational technology movements, they're all based at the end of the day on hardware infrastructure. You can't run generative AI and create generative AI without some really critical infrastructure. Our view is that Cerebrus is that critical infrastructure that is going to be necessary to make generative AI proliferate and be truly productive, right? If you look in the past at, at, at chip companies, um, Intel and AMD made possible personal computing, right? We wouldn't have networking and cloud computing without the likes of Broadcom. We wouldn't have smartphones without the likes of Qualcomm and ARM. And everything we watch in terms of video graphics, the streaming of it, the processing of it, that's NVIDIA and companies of that ilk, right? So Cerebrus is this new generation of chip company, and Andrew will tell you precisely what makes them different, that they're on the cusp of this new wave of technology that generative AI is going to be, right? So you've all probably, like me, experimented with chat GPT, and I, I think it's fun and also a learning experience. But at the end of the day, um, chat GPT and any one of these large language models that, that generate all the text that you read, right, they can't actually work until they're trained. So Let's start first, maybe by having Andrew explain in layman's terms, what is the training of a gen AI model? What are the problems that arise in that training? And how do you guys at Cerebrus solve that training problem? Sure. Uh, Joe, thank you for, for having me. We're, we're honored and uh, we always enjoy talking about, about AI in the market. and. Uh, uh, our, our wives are tired of, of hearing about it. And so we're uh, eager to share <laughs> our views with others. Um, prior to about 
2014, 2015, there was a, a collection of obscure academics who were working in the domain of, uh, of neural networks and of artificial intelligence. And they were laboring in this obscurity because uh, their models never did anything. And that's very interesting. Uh, these are guys that we think of now as, as pioneers in the field, Jeffrey Hinton, um, Bengio, Lacoon, et cetera. Starting in about mid-2014, early 2015, uh, the they had an idea, and that was to change the compute platform that they were working on from CPUs to GPUs. And in so doing, they brought enough compute power to the problem that suddenly these algorithms that had in the past produced absolutely nothing began producing very interesting results. And that's sort of the, the, the kickoff for the, this modern AI push of, of the last eight or so years. And what we saw first was it in, in the, the domain of vision, and suddenly the, uh, these algorithms were able to outperform humans in, in a whole set of tasks involved in vision. Uh, but we, uh, we saw this, and in, in late 2015, my co-founders and I uh, had decided that, that we wanted to work together again. We wanted to put our shoulders to an industry we wanted to try and move an industry with uh, uh, the, the next five or 10 years of our lives. And the industry we love is, is the compute industry. And we saw this on the horizon. And we, we saw that this particular problem had basically infinite compute demand. That even in its earliest stages, what we could see was that as you applied more compute to the problem, uh, the results got better and better. And there are very few problems like that. As you apply more compute to database problems, the results don't get better. A a as you apply compute to uh, almost all of the problems you encounter in the computational world, they don't get better results. But for this work, as you applied more compute, the results got better and better and more accurate and more accurate. And so we we saw this as an opportunity. We we saw this as a uh, a tectonic shift. And historically, tectonic shifts in in applications have produced extraordinary companies uh, underneath in the hardware realm, and they've been tremendous challenges to the existing status quo. Right. For those of you who, who remember the, the, the rise of Ethernet and IP networking in the mid to late 90s didn't help Nortel. Nortel had tremendous share. It, it didn't help Ericsson. It didn't help the installed players. All of them got demolished. And uh, the results were new companies, Cisco, Broadcom, uh, and later Arista and Juniper. Um, in the same way, the companies that had uh, approximately all the share in the PC space uh, with the rise of a new type of compute, uh, a handheld compute that was limited by, by battery power, um, they won approximately zero share, right? There are, are no cell phones running x86 machines, and a whole set of new companies stepped in. We, we saw that sort of opportunity in 2015. We saw an opportunity to build uh, a company on a new technology, uh, on a technology that was not repurposed, right? The graphics processing unit was so named because for 20 years, it was targeted at one particular problem, and that was pushing pixels to a monitor, right? It, it was a graphics engine. And at graphics, it is a perfect machine. Uh, it has... Uh, like remodeling your house or, or other efforts to uh, uh, remodel, it is an imperfect machine for the AI workload. And this is what we saw in 2015. And uh, it was catalyzed by a, a comment our CTO uh, made when he said, wouldn't it be serendipitous if 20 years of tuning for one workload produced a machine well-suited for another? And wouldn't it be odd if a machine designed for pushing pixels to a monitor was good at, at AI. And with that, we, 
uh, we set off on this journey that, that is Cerebrus. Uh, we saw an opportunity uh, to build a different type of chip, a chip that was in every way optimized for one thing, and that was doing AI work. Uh, it looks different. It behaves differently. Uh, in, in every aspect, the, the, the chip is uh, different than a graphics processing unit. It's different than a traditional CPU. Uh, just by give you some idea, uh, it's 56 times larger. Uh, a, our, our current chip has 2.6 trillion uh, transistors, whereas the, the largest chip today has about 80 billion. Uh, it, it has uh, thousands of times more memory. Uh, it has tens of thousands of times more memory bandwidth. It, it, it was a profoundly different machine we chose to build. And, uh, you know, one of the few times in my life that I underestimated the size of the market I was targeting, uh, it turned out that it, we were wrong, that, that AI wasn't going to be big. It was going to be overwhelming and transformative, not just for uh, our portion of the tech market, but for whole economies. And that's what we've seen in the last six or eight months. So that was a bit of backswing. Uh, I hope that wasn't too long. I'll tell you a little bit about, about how we got to where we are. Great, uh, Andrew. That, that's it, that, it's super helpful for you to set the context. So let's talk about the, the whole um, training requirement, right, for, uh, for any type of a large language model. What's all, what, what is that training? If you could explain sort of in plain English, what's involved from a compute standpoint in doing that training? And why is your particular chip and system design more advantageous to somebody doing that training than, than the other, um, you know, devices that are on the market? Sure. Uh, first, AI is divided up into, into two stages. Uh, there's a training stage and there's an inference stage, or sometimes the latter stage is called serving the model. Uh, what is different about AI than uh, other forms of traditional computation is that, uh, and what we'll go by, by example, um, in the past, uh, when you wanted to uh, uh, teach a machine uh, to identify a cat, you wrote a description of whiskers, you wrote a description of paws, you wrote a description of fur, and you, in your algorithm, you described the elements of catness. And uh, this was very specific and prescriptive. Um, when an AI identifies a cat, the algorithm doesn't begins with none of that. The algorithm is instead designed to be shown data. And after thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of images in which uh, it was sort of, it got it right or it got it wrong. <laughs> it improved step by step. It got better and better and better at identifying the cat to the point where even if the cat's in a shadow or you can't see its whiskers or et cetera, there, there is a, uh, the model has learned from huge amounts of data. This is how we began. We moved into the natural language processing domain where we showed the model, we showed the algorithm huge bodies of text. And over time, it began to understand English. And we, we didn't uh, provide it a dictionary to do a translation. We didn't uh, provide it a correlation between a uh, picture of a dog and the word dog. What we did is we provided vast amounts of data and it sifted through this, found patterns in language. Um, and after th this sort of inordinate computational task of sifting through this tremendous data, it came to understand the patterns in the English language or other languages and to understand in some sense, the meaning of words. And this is a brute force compute approach. You, you show in the, these models, you show uh, a model approximately everything ever written in English. And to do this, we scrape the internet, we use all digitized books, we use, I mean, absurd amounts of data. And we uh, grind through this with 
some of the largest compute clusters ever built. And the result is a model that has accumulated insight by being shown data. And when you then stop the training and you ask it a question, it can retrieve this insight. And it can generate a response. And that's what ChatGPT was. And so this was, uh, it, it is at its core, uh, a profoundly computationally intensive task. Um, because the model has to see vast amounts of data. And that data has to be uh, computed in a way so the model can learn. Now, we saw this on the horizon. This part, we, we, we managed to, to get right. Um, and we, we saw that, that the problem was going to be too big for any given chip. In fact, the problem was going to be too big for tens of thousands of chips at a time. And the, uh, the cost in computing of tying together lots of little chips is high. Uh, and the performance of a hundred little chips isn't a hundred times one chip, right? It's vastly lower and costs more because you have to tie them together and it uses more power. And so we had an idea that we could, by building a vastly bigger chip, we could reduce the communication overheads we could reduce the amount of, of times you had to move information. And in so doing, we could vastly accelerate the work. And that's what we did. And just to, to give you an idea, I, I, I have my props. The good thing about being in hardware is we get good props. Um, <laughs> this sad little chip is uh, an NVIDIA A100. And you should lean forward because it's hard to see it's so small. Um, and uh, it's about 800 square millimeters, or for those of you who don't know metric, it's about the size of a postage stamp. This is our chip. All right. And it, it's 46,000 square millimeters. And that allowed us to have in one place vast communication resources, vast compute resources, and vast memory. And that allowed us to do work faster and produce results in less time. And uh, it allowed us to, to build clusters of them. Even one of these is insufficient for some of these large networks to build clusters very differently than with lots of little chips. Now we weren't alone in, in the observation that, that the communication overhead in tying together lots of little chips was gonna be a problem in this, in this domain. And in 2019, uh, NVIDIA bought uh, Mellanox for this exact reason. They paid $7 billion to acquire a company whose sole reason for existence is to tie little chips together. And that's a, a different way of doing it. Um, but our approach has produced results that are vastly faster, use less power, uh, and produce answers in less time. And, and th that was our goal. Uh, and we've been able to deliver this for enterprise customers, uh, for government, for intelligence communities, uh, both domestically and, and internationally. And uh, that's sort of where we are. That's an amazing, uh, from a design, chip design standpoint, as well as a manufacturing standpoint, quite a, a feat of, of engineering, Andrew. Joe, so uh, it was. You know, we, we built a chip bigger than anybody had ever built in the history of compute. There had been other efforts uh, to build chips this large, uh, including by some of the, the biggest names in compute, uh, in, in, including Amdahl. Uh, but we, we, we thought the time was right. We thought the workload was right that made it worth it. Um, and uh, we, we were able to solve a problem that had been unsolved in 80 years and uh, began shipping product in uh, late 2020. Uh, we have since... Uh, shrunk our, our chip from 16 nanometer. We're now at the seven nanometer node. Uh, to give you an idea, you know, the, the, the chip I showed you has 850,000 cores, right? Uh, How many transistors in there? 2.6 trillion. 
Uh, That's an astronomical. Th th these are astronomical I, I numbers. Hard to, <laughs> hard to, hard to even imagine. By the way, for those of you in the audience, when Andrew said that that their latest generation chip has transistors of seven nanometers, seven nanometers is about one ten thousandth, I think, of a, the width of a human hair. And that, that's the distance between transistors. And that gives you approximately how many transistors you can pack in a unit of, of space. And transistors are built up into your, your compute horsepower. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and the NVIDIA uh, chip, uh, the GPU, um, has roughly how many cores, Andrew, in comparison about to 15, your- 000. About 15,000. About 15,000. Uh, today, uh, you know, in, NVIDIA has the lion's share of the market. Uh, they, uh, tremendous credit to them for making hay when the, the sun shined. Um, they were a, a, a better part than the CPU. Uh, they weren't a, a great part for this work. They've tried to remodel and remodel and remodel and make it better and better. Uh, but the market has absolutely exploded. Um, and you have individual customers. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, but the other day Google announced that, that it had, in addition to developing its own processor, it had procured a, a cluster of 25,000 uh, GPUs. So that's a billion dollar buy with a B. Uh, and these are being stood up all over the world. And uh, it, it is the market is is so big, so dynamic. Uh, it, it's an extraordinary place to be right now. Yeah, yeah. the The ability to bring such um, a, a huge um, scale, right, of compute as well as uh, associated memory on a single chip is important because uh, the these large language models are already large in terms of the data sets that have to be processed, but they're only getting larger, right? So I think GPT-3 uh, GPT had, call it 175 billion parameters, right? But the, the latest sort of Microsoft collaboration with OpenAI is going to approach 1 trillion, I'm told, parameters, right? So you can just, for the audience's perspective, think about what you would need to do to process a data set that huge if you have to go through the division of that data set to all those little GPUs that Andrew was talking about compared to being able to squeeze big chunks of that into the Cerebrus processor, right? So you're you're ending up with a with a with a training process that that is you know, significantly less complicated and therefore less co costly than it would otherwise be if you had to deal with all the little GP use that you now have to, you, you basically have to allocate or sequence work to. That, that's exactly right, Joe. And so uh, an easy way to think about it is a, a parameter is equivalent to an independent variable. And so the, these models are looking at hundreds of billions of independent variables, independent explanatory uh, uh, units for understanding language uh, uh, or, or now heading towards trillions. And then you show this enormous set of independent variables, you, you, you show it uh, a trillion tokens. And a, and a token is, uh, you can think about it as a word or a letter or two. Um, and so you're, you're building matrices uh, for uh, the, these calculations that are among the largest matrices ever computed, right? You might imagine two matrices, one that's 40,000 rows by 10,000 columns, or, right? The, the, and you're multiplying two together. The, these are so big they don't fit on traditional machines. And uh, once you have to divide up this work, you, you have this extraordinary challenge of, uh, of of allocating chunks of work to different little machines, to organizing how they're back, how they're reassembled. At the, just to give you an idea, at the, at the back of the, the paper describing GPT-4, uh, they talk about the credit 
to people who were involved just in the breaking up of work. And there are 100 people cited. There were 100 people involved in allocating the, the network, the neural network, over little compute units. It was an absurd uh, amount of work. And uh, uh, it cost billions of dollars to train with a B. Uh, you know, we, we attacked those problems. Uh, it, we put into the open source community seven GPT models. Uh, we did it in a month, uh, maybe cost a million or two to train. And we, we did it with one person. Um, and so uh, now th their, their models were, were bigger and newer, but the, the, the order of magnitude of different allocation of resources to achieve results it, it, is useful there. That's really um, that's really interesting, and I I I I've also heard from some engineering friends that um, you know other than the, the the chip itself, you've you've devised um, some very very innovative um, software, I guess, for lack of a better term, that uh, you know that that the way that these chips run that deal with some of the issues that you just talked about in 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 processing these very large data sets right so you talked about matrices i just recalling my college matrix algebra of course the in order for the process to work properly the 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 matrices have to typically be homogeneous in, in in size, so, so think about a rectangle, and it's got a uniform width and and and, and length, and um, all the rectangles ha have to kind of look that way in order for typical processes to run. But you guys have mm -hmm. created uh, a way of having your chips process heterogeneous um, we, we, matrices we, we, that are not necessarily the same size, and yet do so efficiently. So what do you do? I think that's exactly right. What, what do you do when the data doesn't come in a nice rectangular matrix? What you do is you 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 make it rectangular by stuffing the entries filled with zeros. By padding. Right, by padding. And then you present it to your compute engine. And, and if your compute engine is a standard GPU, it just multiplies those zeros. And in the world of compute, there are few things less intelligent than multiplying by zero. You use power and it takes time, and you, you generate no new information. You knew before the calculation that if you multiply by zero, the result is zero. After the calculation, the result is zero. And all you've done is take time and power. Um, we don't need to do that. In fact, we can decompose the matrix into uh, vectors uh, and multiply them by scalar. So we, we, we avoid this problem. We, we avoid the problem of ever multiplying by zero. Uh, we, we do a, a, a collection of things that uh, we're able to do by virtue of the fact that we're, we specialize in this one type of work. We don't have to carry the burden or the tax of also doing graphics, of also doing 64-bit double precision work for supercompute workloads. We, 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 we are a specialist machine, and we're designed for AI and for workloads that, that, that have the same fundamental underpinnings of AI. And much of the advantage comes from the fact that uh, when you design for uh, and are focused on one particular type of work, um, you can do away with a, a lot of other stuff. Yeah, great. Let's talk about some of the commercial aspects of your business now, Andrew. Uh, perhaps you could highlight um, who some of your current customers are, how they're using your gear. And then uh, as importantly, how would you expect that customer base to change and expand and evolve as Gen AI usage proliferates and becomes more mainstream? Sure, we, we, we go to market. Uh, th thank you for asking about us. We go to market uh, in several different ways. You can uh, purchase our equipment and, and put it on your premise. Uh, you can subscribe to our equipment and it can be on your, your premise. Or you can uh, use our equipment uh, in our cloud and there you can uh, gain access to it by the SIP, so to say, right? By, by the day or by the model or by the week or by the month. 
We have big clusters available uh, to, to do some of the largest language models on Earth. We have small clusters available for smaller problems. Um, and so cu customers, uh, if they have uh, equipment on, uh, if they have a data center, like our customer GSK, uh, the, the, the giant uh, pharmaceutical, uh, they, they have equipment on premise, and, and um, we, we've been able to do all sorts of interesting work. They've, in fact, published work where they use natural language processing models on epigenomic data. Uh, and that's a, a very, very interesting application of language models because DNA is a language. Uh, and, and so both uh, genomic and epigenomic data work really well on when analyzed with uh, large language models. We have customers in the energy space. We have many customers in pharma. We have customers in the energy space, like uh, the French super major Total. There they published work in which we were, uh, a single one of our systems was more than 228 times faster on their work than uh, the top of line GPU. Uh, we have government customers, uh, both uh, throughout the Department of, of Energy and the intelligence communities. Uh, at the Department of Energy, we, we sort of uh, swept uh, the landscape. Our customers include Lawrence Livermore, uh, Argonne National Labs, National Energy Technology Center. Um, we have customers in, uh, in Japan, like Tokyo Electron Devices, in Europe. Uh, uh, so there's a, a collection of, of different customers of, of various sizes and various types. On our cloud, we have uh, both large and small uh, customers like Jasper. Many of you might use Jasper's marketing uh, tools for to generate marketing content. So big and small, you know, Jasper is two years old. GSK is 300 years old. Uh, for, one has, we have companies that just raised their Series A and, and companies that, that have hundreds of billions in revenue, like, like Total. Have you had, just interestingly, let me ask, have you had any financial institutions approach you uh, in order to use this for, you know, training very domain-specific types of um, models that they want to develop? So, for example, a hedge fund that wants to, you know, create a, an AI-based predictive tool for trading decisions? We have uh, trained models for uh, financial institutions, and we've done that on domain-specific financial data. Uh, we've done it on both proprietary data and on open source data. There's a Thomson Reuters data set that they made public uh, a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. We have done fine tuning, which is where you begin with a general model and you, uh, you then show it very, very specific data uh, with the idea that you're then going to uh, have it do work in a very specific domain. And I, I think the, 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 maybe the, the way to think about it for, for the audience is, is that uh, general training uh, of, of these GPT models, and the G stands for general, right? It's, it's a general pre-trained model. Um, you might think of as, as maybe you're, you're taking your four-year-old and, and having them do cardio and weights. And you do that for two years or three years. And the, the idea is um, whether you then present your child uh, a task in wrestling or javelin or karate, they are pretty well, pretty well situated. <laughs> they're fit. <laughs> they're strong. They can do uh, lots of different things. The idea with pre-training is, is a foundation on, on which to build. The idea with fine-tuning is if you then say, why don't we do 50 karate classes? On the foundation of fitness, you add this very specific expertise. And then you say, how are you going to do on karate tasks? Right? That, that's the inference. Here's a karate task. And what we've shown over time across the industry is that works really well. Uh, you train on a general data set, and then you show very, very specific tasks for your domain-specific activities. And so that's exactly what you described, Joe, and, and that's uh, we do that all day, every day for, for customers. Great. 
I'm going to ask a final question and then turn you over to our audience for Q and A, Andrew. Sure. Um, so, uh, in in our business at Link2, one of the uh, private market databases we use consistently is provided by an outfit called PitchBook. Mm -hmm. And they recently built uh, an interesting analytical tool that, uh, you know, takes in inputs regarding uh, a, a private company uh, and, and its markets. And, and they basically uh, use that data to make a prediction as to how successful that company will be right. uh, in doing an IPO. Right. Um, the, that, that predictor assigned uh, a rating of 99% to Cerebrus. Congratulations. Well, clearly, well, clearly it's right. Um, and I, <laughs> I, while, while I was go, go, going to, 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 uh, to attack that predictor, I, I now realize the error of my ways and, and how obviously correct that, that model is. Um, I, I think so with- This is obviously correct. Here's my question for you. Um, <laughs> It's a little bit of a mind experiment. So fast forward to, you know, whenever, 2024 or, right. or, or some date in the near future, you are sitting in New York in a large conference room with the um, all the, the buy side analysts from the top institutional investors in the country, your Fidelities, your Vanguards, your BlackRock, Franklin Templeton's. What would be the top three reasons you would give them for buying into Cerebrus's IPO? You know, I, I think uh, in my experience, uh, large and growing markets are uh, where you want to be. And I, I think in, in my analysis of, of opportunities, and I, I, I evaluate uh, fewer opportunities than you do, and your uh, the people on this call because I, I I mostly invest years of my life behind a, a single bet, and um, the structure of the market and the size of the opportunity is, is foundational in my thinking. And I I think uh, it's hard you're hard pressed to find people who when they look carefully and thoughtfully at, at AI don't come away saying uh, this is an economic dislocation of, of tremendous uh, reach. You know, Bill Gates talked about it as bigger than the internet. Um, and so part one is um, what is happening in AI right now uh, is transformative, uh, not to a little corner of the compute world, but to how we live, work, and play. Yeah. And uh, I, I tell people that uh, my nine-year-old granddaughter uh, uses AI unbeknownst to her when uh, 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 Netflix recommends a cartoon for her. Uh, my 92-year-old mother-in-law, she uh, uses AI when she asks Alexa to, to play a Frank Sinatra playlist. And uh, Alexa puts together a playlist that um, includes songs she forgot she liked. I think AI is creeping into uh, the way uh, we do things, right? It's in your phone right now and selecting your route home. It is uh, sort of step-by-step step in the background uh, creeping in. And that's before the big impact, right? The, the, the big impacts of, of a technological shift are not when they replace things we already do. Right, the big impact of compute was not when they replaced typewriters or they replaced uh, general ledgers. Right, the general ledger accountants in the old world were extremely efficient. Um, the, the the big uh, economic change came when technology allows you to reorganize resources fundamentally. When we went to the cloud, there was a huge change. It allowed software to be allocated differently. It opened the world for SaaS. It created vast sort of different uh, economic opportunities. And we still even ha haven't seen that with AI. Right now, AI is doing copywriting better. It it's producing a, a better type of search. It is, uh, it is helping us generate better code. Um, it is... Uh, uh, 
re removing the laborious tasks of uh, um, of, of visiting a building before you insure it by driving by it instead of taking photos from from satellites or from drones. It, it is doing hundreds of things, uh, but many of those, the vast majority of things were already being done, perhaps inefficiently by people, but were being done. I, I think the most exciting part is when suddenly we're doing things that weren't done. And so I would begin with that discussion with, 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 uh, with everybody where I share the view that, 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 that this isn't uh, a little thing. Uh, th th this is the rise of something profound. I, I would say that uh, in those environments, uh, again and again, uh, have emerged new hardware platforms. And that is the history of the emergence of new hardware. Uh, it is very hard in the status quo for new hardware to emerge, right? Uh, nobody has made a meaningful threat on uh, AMD or Intel in the x86 world for decades at a time. And then there was a threat that emerged with the rise of discrete graphics, right? And boom, they got no share. AMD acquired a company to get share, but Intel had approximately zero share. There emerged a, a rise of a new workload in uh, the moving of data uh, in IP networking. Intel could have done that. They had zero share. There emerged an, an, a new fundamental way of doing compute where it's in your hand, not in a laptop, where it's powered by a very small battery where weight mattered a great deal. New companies came in. And so I, I would point first to the size of the market and second to the history of uh, large dislocations producing great new companies and having really deleterious effects on the status quo. I mean, in, it, Intel has spent, what, 15 or $16 billion acquiring company and has approximately zero share in this market. Uh, you know, I, I, love, I love Lisa Sue and what she's done at AMD is extraordinary. Uh, she is, I think, one of the top three CEOs of the last decade. They have zero share. Um, uh, so I, I, I would first say the size of the market and second, the structure of the opportunity. And finally, I'd say that what we've done is not build a part that's incrementally better. I don't think that's the, the, the way you build a great company. I, we've built uh, a part and a, a technical trajectory uh, that is profoundly better, that uh, involved deep work. We, it, it involved invention on uh, the dimensions of chip design, of system architecture, of power, of cooling, all domains that uh, are fundamental to uh, to building big computers and that the proof is in the pudding and that uh, our customers, not only are they saying nice things, words are cheap, but they're publishing under their name in top journals results that are mind boggling. Great. Thank you, Andrew. I gotta tell you, it's been such a privilege just having you share uh, a lot of those insights and wisdom. And I dare say that, you know, 10 years from now, we'll look back and listen to this interview and realize just how profoundly prophetic uh, you were today. So with that, I will turn this over to our audience for Q&A. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, thanks so much, Andrew. This has been fascinating. We're getting a couple of questions um, regarding the chip itself. Mm -hmm. um, and um, obviously we've already established that you've created the largest chip ever. And as you're in hardware, um, it's great for show and tell. So maybe you should show it again to our audience. <laughs> um, but Hong Chan is asking, could you please elaborate why is the big chip approach better than chiplet approach like Tesla Dojo? Uh, so first, I, I, I think that the, the question begins with an assumption that you need a lot of chips. And also buried in the question is the idea that communication is really important because for those who don't know, uh, Tesla opted for a similar approach. They 
take a wafer, they dice it into individual chips of about 800 square millimeters. But then they place those on an interposer on another piece of silicon. And they place, I think, 64 of them, uh, forgive me if I get that wrong, right next to each other on a single platter, right? And when they're done, uh, they come up with uh, a, a part that has 64 little chips that are next to each other, very, very close. Now, uh, that approach has pros and cons. Uh, uh, we, we know Elon well. He visited us early before he uh, started that project. Um, the problem of placement of those chips is very, very hard. You mechanically have to pick them up and put them down exactly where you need them. And that's historically been a very hard problem. You still have to leave the chip boundary to communicate. So when they communicate, they communicate with a CERDES. And a CERDES is uh, a, uh, a technology that goes from the electrical domain into the optical domain and pushes traffic out the edge of the chip through the interposer to the edge of the next chip. Now, the CERDES takes a great deal of space and power. So their chips run vastly hotter and use a great deal more power than ours. They also get less performance. They get less performance because they had to allocate real estate on each chip for those IOs, for the CERTI blocks. And CERTIs are very large. And so they made a different set of trade-offs. They built a single purpose machine. They built a machine for uh, computer vision as it relates specifically to self-driving cars. Um, they recognized the importance of a big chip. Uh, of having all sorts of compute on a single platter. Uh, we did it on a single piece of silicon. Uh, they do it on two pieces of silicon. Uh, the first is cut up, and the second serves as sort of a, a platter onto which the little ones are stuck. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they're still buying a ton of GPUs, so I, I assume that, that years down since they started the project, it is, it is yet to deliver sort of what they what they wanted. Um, other than that, you know, I, there are a lot of different ways to skin a cat. Um, ours from all data they've shown is higher performance and less power. Uh, but uh, I, I'm sure there are all sorts of thoughtful architectural reasons that, that they chose their path. Okay, amazing. <clears throat> we have a kind of similar question um, regarding the chip. From James Long. James says, I believed Inovium was building the kind of chips you're talking about. Um, hence, I invested in Inovium. How is are your chips different from the ones Inovium, now Marvel, were our building? So in Inovium, uh, th th that's, well, I'm, I'm glad you invested in Inovium. They worked out okay for you. Uh, uh, Inovium was building a switch chip, and that's a different thing. Th they weren't building a computer. They're not a processor. They were a, if I remember correctly, uh, they competed with Broadcom in building, correct, yeah. building a communication chip. And a, I used to build switch chips. That was the first 15 years of my career. Um, a switch chip has one job. It, it, it takes an address from a packet. It does a lookup and it sends it off uh, in the direction prescribed uh, by a table. And uh, they built uh, big, fast switches, but their, their chips were smaller than this, right? So that they were traditional chips uh, to do switching. Uh, what we've done is uh, we've taken the elements of compute called the core, and we put 850,000 of them on a giant wafer. And we've linked them each core to its own memory. And each one of those cores is a real computer. You could run an OS on it. You could run separate software on each of those 850,000 cores. Now, that's not the, the way we recommend doing it, but you certainly could do it that way. Um, and that's different. The, the, this is a, a, uh, uh, a processor, whereas they were a switch chip. 
Okay, great. I'm going to ask Stephen, who's hold, holding his hand up to ask a question, to come over and ask it for you live. So let me just pull him over. But they sound so smart, Irene, with that English accent. I mean, everything sounds better with an English accent. No, it does. I mean, e e even silly stuff sounds so sort of thoughtful. Great. Um, I'm, I'm glad that's what comes across. <laughs> <laughs> Am I on? Um, Am I on? Stephen, please ask a question. Go for it. Uh, uh, brilliant. So, so uh, I'm, I'm actually already in an investment for you, Bris. Well, thank so, you. Um, uh, you know, pretty excited about your prospects. Um, would love to learn a little bit more about differences with Sambanova, you know, you know, and would um, just like to learn a little bit more about customer acquisition. Sure, uh, Sambanova uh, is uh, uh, a company that has chosen a, a very different path, uh, a path not focused on on performance, um, and has chosen to sort of deprecate their development of hardware underneath uh, the delivery of sort of a combined uh, sort of software offering. Um, I, as I said, there are lots of, of paths in this market. Uh, I think um, our, our view is we, we've never seen uh, performance data that, that makes that strategy the right approach. Um, and this is a, a performance intensive market. Um, we uh, haven't seen in, in, in our discussion with customers who, who've done testing, uh, performance is, is vastly different. Um, but, uh, you, you know, they, Chris Ray, who's one of their founders, is an extremely smart software guy. Uh, and they have a talented team. And, uh, you know, we, we don't see them often, but it's a big space. And I, I think uh, there is, uh, in, in vectors we care about in the performance of, of large language models, I, I think there's uh, plenty of customer data to show that, that we're head and shoulders faster. Um, I, I think they chose a, a less innovative strategy. They built chips of approximately the same size as everybody else's. Their uh, approach is to, to gang several processors together. This is uh, a pretty straightforward approach that's been done before. On the other hand, they're smart guys, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure they're, they're getting uh, decent results from, from that approach. Customer acquisition uh, certainly wasn't hurt by the, the, the last four months of, of uh, sort of frenzy over chat GPT. Um, you know, maybe a year ago, uh, you, you'd be in working with a small group in a large company, and the group might be led by a wizard, uh, in, not with the, the sleeves wizard, but a, a wizard who has some uh, sort of is recognized as, as, as a technology guru. Um, uh, and suddenly, uh, every board member in every large company is asking uh, you know, the, the, the global 500, you know, what's your AI strategy? How's AI going to impact our business? Uh, projects are being kicked off at fast moving and slow moving companies of, of every size. And so this is true domestically. This is true internationally. Uh, there is a, uh, an extraordinary push this minute for uh, these large enterprise customers to have AI strategies to think about more generally how to use data assets, which are, were expensive to obtain, how to use them to uh, create differentiation, to create durable advantage, and to, to, to find value in them. And I, I think for those of us who, who work in this domain, uh, data is the, the new oil, right? And these companies have extraordinarily rich data assets. And frequently, they don't exactly know how to turn them into value. And that, that's something that's very much top of mind, Stephen, a, a, across the world as we see, engage with large companies. Um, and so uh, at the same time, the venture community has poured vast money into startups doing AI work. And so while we're working with the sort of global 500s, th there's sort of a, a plethora of, of little startups who 
uh, have raised 10 or $20 million who, who need five or $7 million worth of, of training done. And uh, they are uh, uh, interesting and fun to work with and they're, they're, they're pushing the AI to, uh, to new levels. Whereas the, uh, the larger companies frequently want others to invent the AI and want to rely on their data to, to provide insight. Did that answer the question? Yeah, no, 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 that is um, uh, that is a, a, an excellent answer. You know, and then just a, a real, just a real quick follow follow up from that. Um, so, you know, I know you mentioned you know Qualcomm and um, its sort of position um, as mobile technology took off. So Qualcomm, Qualcomm had you know the, the strategic partnerships with um, Samsung and sort of other handset manufacturers. You know. It, uh, uh, you know, what are the key strategic partnerships that will drive Cerebrus growth? Yeah, I, I think the, the structure of the market is, is, is obviously very different. Uh, they are a, an embedded component provider and we're a system solution provider. Um, and I, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Stephen, in, in thinking carefully about what are the partnerships that, that a company like, like ours needs to, uh, to, to develop in order to support rapid growth and global distribution. Um, I, I think those are uh, very much the, uh, the right questions to ask. I, I don't think it's necessarily um, the same as uh, other, uh, the, the embedded handset market. I, I think uh, there are for all intents and purposes, only 10 ways to get your uh, cell phone chip to market in the world. With about what a third a third of the market being one company, <laughs> Apple, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if you then throw in Samsung, not now you're at half the market. So um, th th there are really a very small number of ways for them to get to market. Um, I think one of the beautiful things about the cloud is we we can provide services uh, with uh, our U.S. facility. We have partners uh, in Europe who. Uh, fall within the, the, the European data regulations where we can provide compute today for anybody in the world. Uh, you can come, you can jump on the cloud, you can uh, get the benefit of this by, by, the, by the day, by the week, by the month, um, by the model. And so I, I think that changes the dynamic rather significantly um, and, and makes... Uh, sort of the traditional partners whose job it was to distribute your product, uh, it, it forces them to, to find a different way to add value, right? To, to engage with, uh, maybe they are specialists in tuning models for the finance community. Maybe they are specialists in uh, the analysis of medical records, uh, which is a, a very interesting domain for, for AI. Um, uh, what, what you would like to do is to be able to take medical records, this plethora of medical records, and this is almost always done outside of the U.S. because of HIPAA and all sorts of requirements in the U.S. But in countries that have nationalized health care, you have big data sets of medical records. And what you'd like to be able to do is to predict uh, the, the next illness based on medical records, right? That's the generative aspect of that problem. And there are groups that are uh, engaged in that research. It's a very hard problem. Doctors are notoriously bad at, at, at filling out medical records, but there's been more standardization. There are tremendous opportunities there. There are places that have uh, genetic data and have medical records. And what you'd like to do is tie together the genomic data uh, the phenotypical data, the health outcome data, and and make predictions again on uh, on on future health challenges and and what you might be able to do preventatively, and so I, I think Stephen the, the the structure of partnerships uh, in this domain may may much more look like uh, uh, software partnerships where. Uh, rather than, than than distribution partnerships, they are people who who have the ability to use AI to provide unique insight, and then have your 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 customers and their customers want a combined solution of 
their software and your our hardware on premise solving a particular problem day to day with their data. Andrew, thank you so much. Um, we are at time. Uh, wanted to make sure that we don't keep you too too long. But I think um, we have, and there are so many more questions that are still coming in and, and people want to answer. So uh, if all of you are on the audience, want Andrew back for another show of part two of uh, this AI environment, just uh, let us know in the chat, say, yes, we'd like Andrew back and we'd like him back tomorrow or next day. And we'll schedule it with Andrew when he can come back. Um, what um, If you want to close us out with perhaps one or two sentences, I think, Andrew, uh, uh, looking into the future as a futurist, what perhaps do you see the major change going to be using, using AI, but I mean, specifically, you are the uh, the rock that allows everyone else to generate AI stuff. But what, as a futurist, what would you say to look out for? Well, first I'd say that today we're the pebble aspiring to be the rock. Um, I, I think we are sort of a pebble aspiring to be a boulder. Um, I, I, I think we don't have to look out very far to see uh, a tremendous impact across white collar professions. And I think many of our innovations uh, over the past 25 years in, in tech have uh, made, uh, have gone after uh, blue collar labor, uh, robotics in particular, uh, gains in efficiency, uh, have sort of reduced the role of, of technicians or, or, or increased the role and reduced the number. Um, I think. Uh, generative AI will change what it is to be a lawyer. It will change what it is to be a doctor. It will change what it is to be a wealth manager. It will change uh, a whole set of, of professions that have remained in many ways uh, immune to technical changes. We practice law approximately the same way we prax practiced it two or 300 years ago. Uh, uh, I'm interested personally in uh, how it impacts teaching. Uh, we teach approximately the same way we taught 2,000 years ago, and there are very few social institutions that have remained unchanged. Our families aren't the same as they were 2,000 years ago. Uh, if you look at the bedrock of our institution, our religions aren't the same, our, our values, but the way we teach children actually is not very different from the way Aristotle taught Alexander the Great. And th that is a bummer. And I, I think it is, we teach without data. Uh, we, we teach uh, in a, a, a bizarrely, I mean, it's before medieval uh, way. And I, I think uh, AI will uh, attack some of these institutions uh, and transform them, these institutions that have remained sort of immune uh, to, 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 to change. Uh, and, and I think that is a really interesting thing. So much. So thank you, Andrew. That's so much to explore. And we've got a uh, resounding yes. Uh, a lot of people want to see you back. So uh, we'll coordinate uh, with you for that next part too. Um, but Joe, Irene, thank you all for, uh, for, for putting this together for us. Uh, thank you for all, thank you to all the attendees. Uh, you've got great questions in there. Uh, we had <clears throat> a, a couple of hundred people who registered for this event today. Uh, some of you were able to make it, some of you were not. We'll send you a note with the recording so you can review some of this conversation. Uh, respond back to us on that email and let us know uh, some of the questions that you would like us to prepare, uh, Andrew, for, for part two of this show. Uh, so be engaged and let us know what it is that you want. We did have a couple of questions from investors that are talking about they'd like to know a little bit more about uh, your market position and some of the questions that Joe perhaps touched on a little bit earlier, but more in-depth questions. Andrew, we'll send this back to you and your team so that you are, you've are you got a heads up for our next time around. Joe, do you want to say a couple of words, Irene, and then we can close this? Just uh, thank you again, Andrew. It's, uh, it's a real privilege having you here. and. Hopefully, uh, you'll come back uh, sooner rather than later. Perhaps uh, your interviewer then will be a bot who will be immensely <laughs> more 
intelligent than me yeah. and will be armed with an English accent to boot. As long as it has Irene's accent, I think we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew. There's a bunch of questions that didn't get asked, um, so I'll send them over. All right, we appreciate Great. it. Thank Thanks, you guys Andrew. for making time to, to to listen to us and learn a little bit about the AI market. Be Great. well, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.